and I am the founder of Entrepreneurs Collective and I want to welcome you to our Springboard 2021 series. Uh, we know last year was tough uh, for a lot of you guys, uh, for us as well. Uh, so here at Entrepreneurs Collective, we wanted to put on a series of events uh, to really help founders to kick off 2021 in a strong way uh, by getting some amazingly exper experienced uh, and brilliant speakers to come in and share with you their hints and tips, their advice on how to succeed at, at, at a number of areas. Um, I'm super excited tonight um, um, for um, our, our, um, our workshop, which is on fundraising and pitch decks. Uh, and we've got some brilliant speakers as well. Um, but just to, before we, we, we int introduce you to the speakers, um, just want to talk a little bit more about what we do at Entrepreneurs Collective. Um, our basic, our mission is, uh, and what we believe in, is founders helping founders. Uh, uh, I'm a founder myself. Uh, I was previously a lawyer, um, but I set up a dating app a, a few years ago before setting up uh, another couple of companies as well. Uh, and basically, being a founder is tough very tough uh, you know you have to take on learn a number of new skills uh, uh, do things that you've never done before and we believe uh, that good quality founders are the best people to help you to succeed and to increase your chances of success uh, so what we do is we run a number of um, we have a number of support and areas uh, we run events like this um, we do pitch events we do uh, online events, um, we do uh, help with things like deck reviews, we have a number of partnership agreements and credits for our startup members, uh, and we have everything from workshops to assistance with fundraising. Uh, and we do this um, uh, 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 for startups across the range from really early stage startups all the way through to scale ups um, and, and membership, you know, starts at less than £40 a month. Um, so that's a sort of what we do. If that's something of interest, please do reach out. Um, uh, Daniel will post my LinkedIn here. So uh, please connect with me if you want to, uh, to learn a little bit more about what we do. Um, our next event is actually a Founders Roundtable. So what we do is we get a number of you uh, uh, who are founders in a room together. Uh, and this is sort of to talk, to chat to each other and, and help each other to give advice and see how, how we can help uh, uh, guide, our, our, guide our founders uh, through the next stage of their journey. Um, but without further ado, we're going to move across to our main um, event for the evening. Uh, and we're incredibly lucky uh, uh, tonight uh, to have some brilliant speakers. Um, we have Louise Robertson, uh, Chief Morgan, marketing officer with a vision uh, with a, a stellar um, track record um, she was recognized by the fintech power list uh, described um, by oracle as a unicorn cmo and she is part of the insuretech uk innovation working group uh, and she champions strategic go-to-market plans and agile implementation uh, why don't you say a quick hi to us louise hi everybody perfect um, uh, also, we have with us um, Barbara Brundel Bruce, uh, a classic entrepreneur who's scaled multiple high profile businesses in London, New York, and Monaco, um, um, spanning fashion, telecoms, and entertainment. Um, Barbara is based in, um, in London and manages a network of family office investors called Bespoke Connections, uh, where she helps to, uh, to fund uh, deals of five million plus. Uh, um, so yeah, where we have you on here, Barbara. Hello, Great. hi everyone. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, and finally, we also have um, James McKay, um, who's a brand and strategy uh, designer specialized in early stage businesses with over 10 years of experience in designing pitch decks and works with clients across the globe. Uh, where have you, James? Do we have you on as well? Indeed. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Uh, so I think, as, as hope you will agree, uh, we have three uh, stellar speakers for tonight, and they're going to be covering a range of topics from fundraising to how to, to draft your pitch deck. Um, and what I'd say before I hand you across to you guys, um, 
you know, if you have any questions, please put that in the chat. Um, we will leave it with with the um, the speakers. If they want to answer the question during the chat, they can do. Um, if not, we will um, revert back at the end and we'll cover some questions uh, 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 at, at the end of the session. Um, but without further ado, uh, I'll hand you over uh, to, is it Louise who's kicking off or? Me. Yeah. Barbara. Barbara, okay. Next. I'm right. going first. Okay. Over to you, Barbara. <laughs> Leave it to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having us back. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Barbara bruden Bruce, and um, I am, yes, a classic entrepreneur who loves the next best thing. I think um, what I've learned over my career in startups um, is that if you see some traction in the business, that's the time, that's when doors are opening, that's the time that you need to get your financials in a row and start to start to think about raising money for that business. You don't want to put all the money in yourself, you do want to get help. Um, and if you're an entrepreneur like me, you're likely to take some risks. And when you are going to start to take some risks and you do want to get some money from um, the market, get some capital in, you really do need to know that your, your business is in a good state to do it. So I started out my career not in startups. I, I actually started, I invested into a, someone else's startup and uh, about eight of us all invested into a startup and then I ended up being part of the management team. We worked at it for two or three years and out of London and, um, and Switzerland. And our advisors actually said, why did we IPO this business? It was a telecoms reseller and making really good money and we IPO'd it on NASDAQ. So that was incredibly exciting. We did well out of it and decided to do a tally housing business straight off the back of it because everyone needed somewhere to put their massive great switches to switch all this traffic that they had. Um, so we did that and that also got, um, got a bid to buy it for an awful lot of money. And we just went, yes, take our money. Yeah, we'll take your money even. Um, so when you have some money like that, you've got lots of decks coming across and you say, okay, what am I gonna do? What, what am I gonna do next? And one of them was a business which ended up being Fabric Nightclub. And we, we went, oh, okay, how, how on earth can you make money out of a nightclub and be safe with it? And our advisors said to us, look, you can buy the property and it was like, hey, we can do this, it's, it's huge. So we bought what became Fabric, which was a old meat storage locker, literally peeling off cork from the walls and you know working out what to do with this crazy space. Smith and Smithfields, which came up next door and then a, a block behind it. So we were sort of, there was nothing in Clerkenwell, there was barely a Tesco back then. Um, so we created this nightclub, got an incredible team on board, scaled that up, made it really underground. It was an amazing experience. Built a music label, sold both pieces off. And then I went, oh, I'm gonna do fashion now. So <laughs> off I drop and then set up a fashion label and get the family office to invest in my fashion label. And off I go with my daughter to New York, set up fashion, create this thing. I literally did everything myself to begin with and then built it up as you should do as founder and um, sold that one off a few years later. I've done a few more businesses in between, but I think it's quite interesting what I do now. I work for Bespoke Connections in London and we raise capital for entrepreneurs. We do it largely for fun, but it's so interesting for me having come all that way, having to um, build, scale, finance my own business to actually know how you do financing. So there's lots of questions you can ask me, but I'm just gonna move on to the lovely James, um, who will tell you about what he does. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for that, Barbara. And um, yeah, what an introduction to follow, amazing success. Um, so hi everybody, um, welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, my name is James. I run Pitchwork, which is a consultancy focused on helping early stage companies find their feet in uh, business brand and strategy. Um, so one of the services that we, we focus on uh, it circles around building compelling, clear and uh, concise investment decks for, um, for companies uh, and assisting them building this uh, a strong business case. Um, and I make... <laughs> I make a crass joke almost daily that you know we 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 assist companies uh, 
we assist companies in, in raising money and then we help them spend money um, because we help with a number of other services as they scale and grow from uh, design and strategy. But that's another conversation for another day. Um, so we generally work with businesses from uh, the back of fag pa packet ideas, you know, friends and family around all the way up to series A. Um, we, we look after a couple of people past there, but it's, it's not too uh, commonplace. Um, and so I set up Pitchwork because of two quite distinct uh, sets of experiences. So one is that I'd gone through the early stage funding process uh, with my own startup, a past startup, um, and along the journey it helped sort of friends uh, and other founders um, uh, uh, build uh, business cases, pitch decks, and um, and raise money across that across that time. Um, and that also came off the back of ten plus years, as Michael said, in in brand and strategy. And so found quite an interesting uh, niche uh, for myself and uh, I've been doing that successfully for the last two years and I've been adding value hopefully um, and so yeah fingers crossed I'm, I'm well placed to give you some some good key advice uh, alongside Barbara and, and Louise um, and with that I'll, I'll hand over to Louise we can kick it off. Hi Louise Robertson um, I have a classical marketing background I work for Bayer Pharmaceuticals in the non-glamorous area of dental um, and I moved on from there to Lexus <laughs> where I was part of the team that Electro um, created the financialtimes.com. So turning what was print into the first, you know, subscribable newspaper. I then hit my, my sweet spot, which is the exciting world of scale up and startups. So I help locals re raise a series A, uh, Ventus I'm working with at the moment to re raise their first series A, and ASIN who've just raised a rather healthy series A of 12.6 million. So in my marketing career, I've dealt with, as, as James put it, the fag packet budget, where you've got nothing and roll your sleeves up and you're a founder around the kitchen table to the, we've just landed 12.6 million pounds. So we're gonna buy new carpet and have a really big party. So yeah, <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit about, um, about how you get funding in a pandemic. So back to you, Barbara. Okay, yes. When do you go out to raise money? I think dispelling the myth. There's no money in a pandemic. It's not the right pitch for the money now. We need to meet in person. I think so much has changed in this last year. Um, we have seen the, the rise of Zoom, of course. We used to have to, I used to wait for investors to be in London or I was going to be in Zurich or I'm going to be in Monaco and they'd say, oh, let's meet for a coffee then. No, actually now they're quite, they're, they're quite happy to say, let's set up a Zoom next week. So that's interesting. I think um, I think last year investors went through a bit of a wobble, and they um, and they went, oh, we don't really know what to do because we're used to meeting people. So um, I think they do look at look hard at the investment now. It has to be an amazing deck. You really have to get get it get it right to get their attention because you're not going to potentially get in front of them for that elevator pitch. Um, but they will. Uh, look at the investment. They will do do their do their DD and look in the data room. And if they can, I think this this coming um, this coming year we're going to see investors meeting in person after seriously having looked at investments in the last uh, year or or few months. They take a long time to invest, by the way, um, and um, seeing lots of traction. So this is what we'll be talking about tonight and you're welcome to ask questions throughout and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. So we'll be looking at the problem, we'll be looking at the timing, proving traction, the roadmap, and then we're gonna finish off with financials. Problem, uh, that's over to me. Um, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is the, this is the starting point of any deck. What is the market problem that your solution is, 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 provide, is solving? Um, so can you go to the next slide for me? Thank you. How clearly can you define that problem? Um, from an investor's point of view, the bigger the pain point, the better. Um, and for you, it's, it's really important that you can describe this pain and this need so it's understandable. A lot of pitch decks go into really in intricate details about the why and the wherefore. What you need to be able to define is who in the market has the pain, how big this sector is and what their pain is. And then 
be really aware, as, as Barbara said, we all Google things, don't we? But it's you'd be amazed how many decks we see coming past us and how many decks I've had to work on that don't actually say they've got com competitors. If there's a pain in the market, your users and your target market will be solving that pain in their own way. So if you haven't got a CRM, you'll be using multiple Excel spreadsheets. So please, when you're doing your deck, define what people are doing now. I mean, if you were a BNB um, back 20 years ago, you wouldn't have ever anticipate that Airbnb would come along. So when they were going for the funding, if you see their deck, they talk about they were giving an easier way for people with bedrooms to let it out. So you have to say what people are doing now. And then next one, thanks. And if you can't conv convince the investor that there is a problem and that your solution will will um, will solve it, you're not going to get past the first the first couple of slides. So your first slide should be your pain point really defined, size of it, how you solve it, and the competitors are out there, and then move on into your story. But that has to be at the beginning of your deck. Very true. And so I think I'm jumping back in again to talk about timing. Um, so there's a couple of things I'm talking to uh, on this webinar, this this session, and both of them are really important to me. So, so timing, it's one of the things in pitches that I often think is, is, is overlooked, but is kind of fundamentally important part of it. Um, it's often thought that a good idea is will be successful by default, right? But it, that's not the case. So it's oftentimes you see that uh, that the businesses die on the vine, as it were. So a good idea in isolation doesn't uh, doesn't mean very much, um, especially in the face of, of market or competitor, or the market or competitor landscape. Um, and so, uh, as an example of that, uh, specific to timing, um, you know, you wouldn't see people pitching Blockbuster in the face of Netflix now. Um, it, it, it's it's illogical. And so, you always want to be trying to catch the wave um, of change uh, and and make sure that you can convince an investor. That now is the right time to be developing and building uh, your product and um, what you want to be doing as i said it, it is moving on an upward trend and making sure that that's clearly conveyed uh, within within the deck um it's it's often it's often true um and I, i'm sure um louise and barbara could talk a little bit more about this but um funds often try to identify trends um that they see within uh, within the world around them observe shifts um, that are occurring to uh, focus their investment on. And so uh, a couple that were even pre-pandemic were things like remote work, the future of, of, of the remote work and health tech and so on. Um, so I know those, those, those were being looked at and spoken about prior to, uh, prior to the, the global pandemic. And so they've only, they've only come uh, more true um, uh, after the fact. Um, and so when we're talking about a narrative in the pitch or when we're talking about telling a story, um, the job of the timing slide is really to try and reflect that the change in the world, um, uh, the change in the world that you're seeing um, increases the likelihood of your business success as opposed to um, uh, is a detriment to it. Um, and so with that in mind, um, uh, what change looks like can be varied. And so what I try to, what I mean by this um, uh, is that my re response to this would be varied too. And so if we were going back to March, 2020, as an example, and we were talking about timing, uh, the events, space, travel, hospitality, uh, and so on, my, my advice would be actually to buckle up, not to seek investment, to go into power save mode, um, because the timing's against you. And I think Barbara, you probably agree with that. Um, going back and looking at the landscape and how investors were behaving around that time. Now, uh, as an example, we're looking at a return to normal on the not too distant horizon. I'm touching wood as I say that, guys, by the way. Um, we're forecasting, you know, the roaring 20s. I'm seeing in the event space with some businesses I'm working with, events selling out in record time. Um, and so the feeling if you were in that space now would be to uh, ramp up and get ready to, to ride it to the moon. You know, now is a good time to be getting back in and involved in that sort of thing. Um, and so this is, this is a slightly off topic um, point, but it's true that sometimes you need to keep your powder dry and not spend. And this may be something that Louise will talk more about, but um, there are times when you wanna power down and conserve and, um, and uh, wait for the most opportune time to, to try and launch your idea. But to go back to the point and to try and round up, um, 
you know, um, any number of things can cause a change that creates an opportunity within the market. And your job is to try and frame that. And so it could be anything from legislation, um, and we could reference the cannabis industry in recent years uh, for that, a shift in the collective conscience. Um, and we were discussing headspace and calm, uh, Louise Barber, the other day. I mean, 10 years ago, that would have been unthinkable that that would be within the collective conscience now, and people would, would look to be doing things like um, meditation and so on. Um, there's new technological evolutions, things like blockchain, crypto, and so on, that just radically change and shift uh, uh, opportunities. Um, and there's changes in public behavior, and I suppose we can thank or, or curse the, the pandemic for that with things like health tech and hygiene tech um, coming through at the moment. And um, uh, I'm seeing a lot of that. And so the point here has been that the only constant often is change. And what change will you use to leverage uh, will you choose to leverage uh, to build success off of? Uh, and more importantly, how do you make that part of your story to make it resonate with the investor and make them want to uh, invest? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I've got chat stuck on. Proving traction. Well, that's actually, so James has talked about timing. Timing is absolutely everything. Um, you come in, you know, you, it, you can't sell suntan lotion when it's pissing with rain. You can sell umbrellas. So have your umbrellas ready. Ready, You know, if it's rain, it's, look out the window. If it's raining, you'll be able to sell umbrellas. If it's sunny, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to sell sunblock. It's not quite as simple as that, but you do have to. You have to be aware of what you've got and where it fits in that in, in the time plan of where we are in the environment and eco-socially. Um, can I have my next slide? Thank you. Apologies. Right, so this, this is my favorite one. Um, you have to be really honest about your idea because Barbara and I and James get lots of phone calls. I had lots in the pandemic um, where people, a really, a really wonderful startup, I don't think they're on the, um, the call today called Easel, look them up, E-A-S-O-L. They went into hibernation and they're just coming out now. Now they're like an Airbnb marketplace for people that are leisure. So they run like, if you run yoga retreats or you run yachting weekends and you've got a house, um, they've got a special um, software that you can build your website and it takes all your payments. Had they launched that in the pandemic, they'd have burned through their funding um, and they wouldn't have got anywhere because no one could open up. Now they're, now they're onboarding something like 20 to 30 new businesses a day because the 21st of June is, is, is coming along. So it is about knowing your idea fits and knowing when to learn, lend it. And also being really honest, some ideas just don't deserve the light of day. Next one, cheers. So test traction before taking money. This always amazes me. So people come along and they want 2 million, 10 million, 100 grand but they actually haven't got a minimal viable product. Now, I don't mean all singing and dancing. You've got your vision, your, where, where you want to be, but you have to have something that you can prove people will adopt, sell, or use. So you've got to have your early adopters, and along with early adopters come your early investors. This is your family and friends round, or just your savings. Investors won't put anything in when you haven't put anything in and you haven't got anything to prove. So be really clear about what traction you've got. Is it users? Is it product or is it funding? What are you gonna show them? Um, have you got beta testers? Of the people that have used your product and can see the product, have you got feedback from them? Do, do they love the product? Is, there, is it sticky or will it be sticky? Have you got people that buy into your, vin, your vision? So one and another client that we're working with um, is a food brand and Ocado have just um, signed up for a limited trial for him. That's huge in the way of funding. If you can put, if you can put a cardo on your deck to say, I've got traction, I'm doing a minimal viable product run with a cardo, then, then you're on the way. But be, be really careful. There needs to be um, a place where you can, you can actually put your hand on your heart and say, I need 200,000 pounds or I need 2 million pounds. I've already tested this idea it's market worthy and I'm going to go out and I'm going to raise funds. And so it's bounced back over to me again. So a clear roadmap. Um, so this is something else that I think is, is really important as well. Um, and it's also a great opportunity in a pitch to, to really kind of seal the deal, especially ahead of, of talking about any financials or commercials. And so um, it's all well and good having a great idea, um, but a perfect quote here, as, as the late great Steve Jobs said, real artists ship and 
what he meant by that is that success comes by delivering on your vision. And so this is really the slide where you can convince investors that you can do that. Um, ideas really are 10 a penny. Um, and it's, it's only the people that actually move and execute um, that, that deserve to have any kind of traction and, and success. Um, and so because, um, because you can talk about uh, the past, uh, the present and the future on this one slide, it, it really helps uh, investors understand the vision uh, super clear. Um, so all on one slide, you get to show them the milestones that you've hit to date. Um, you get to talk about the traction that you've had um, and you get to tell them where you're going in the future. And um, again, at the, by the point in a pitch, you normally hit something like a roadmap. You've convinced them that the, there is a problem, that there is a solution, you know how to do it. And you, you've presented them with that solution. They understand the market size, that there's a great opportunity there. You may be talked about things like um, go to market or commercialization of it. Um, and now they're really, they're bought in, you're about to ask them for cash and you need to convince them that you can deliver that. And so uh, roadmaps going out 18, 24 months are excellent ways to do that. And um, it's, uh, yeah, and so it, it, it's essentially justifying your ask and that might only be relevant if you like parks and recreation, by the way, that, that screen. But um, uh, yeah, you're about to literally ask people for money um, and uh, it's it's a, it's a great way to uh, to justify what you're going to ask them for. And so on the following slide, you'll be asking for X amount. On this slide, you're going to be telling them exactly what you do with it. So you've preempted any questions that they may have. And so you get you get them excited for the idea. You tell them how you're going to spend the money, and then you ask them for the money. And it's a validation slide in essence. Um, and I suppose, um, Barbara, that's a nice way of introing into the financial slide, I suppose. I'll, I'll, hand back over to you. Thank you very much. Right, I think we could go straight to the next slide. Um, yeah. Financials. Um, yes, it's something we all have to do. I hate financials, but I, I am the person who loves being sold to. So you can sell me an idea every single day. I don't really want to look at it until I know what, what the financials are saying. So in that, um, in that information that you send to someone like me, I would be looking at what stage you're at. So if, it, if you happen to be sending your first email to say a friend or um, someone who you know who invests in the sector who may have invested into something similar, um, you need to put right in the top of the email what stage you're at and, and what it is. So it might be seed stage consumer, it might be early stage, uh, blockchain something or another um, you don't have to say what you just just give them a little bit about what you're looking for um, next you next do you want to say how much you're raising maybe further on down um, I think you want to um, ask um, yeah if you want to you want to give them how much revenue you're making I think that's really important you want to tell them how much money you're burning because that will say, you know, how far away you are before you're going to start making money. I would do predicted revenue for the next three years. And I know that's hard sometimes when you're just getting started, but it did, if you are a big player, if you're SaaS, that model can scale up very quickly and that gets very exciting for some investors. You want to say how much you've raised to date. And that might be, I put in my own money, I've scaled this so far myself or I've got these sorts of backers already. So, um, so that's always interesting. Um, uh, what else? How much investment you're looking for? And that might be um, a time where you go, right, I'm, 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 you know, I've put in 50,000 and now I'm looking for another million. The investor might go, hang on a moment, that's a lot of money. So you have to say, I'm doing it because of X and I'm scaling it because of X. And then I would put in there also, what your customers are currently and what you have in your pipeline because you might be really close to you might have you might be in consumer for example you might have tesco already and you already have Ocado and um, sainsbury's sort of lined up and then who's your potential exit who are you thinking about selling your business to so that would be 
where I would, in a nutshell, um, position your financials. Okay, I think that, that brings us to an end, doesn't it, James? I think it does. One of the things I was going to make a point on there as well is, I don't know if it's a British thing that we're all very overly polite and so on, but it's fantastically, uh, it's, it's fantastic and, and, and amusing how often I come across decks where people are too shy to actually have the ask within the deck or, or it'll be, you know, point five at the very last slide and it's just not clear. And one of the things that's quite frustrating is, is, is if you're asking for money, you have to be clear that you're asking for money and make it, make it, um, not front and center, back and center, I suppose. So the closing slide, it has to, it has to really hammer home exactly what you're after what you want to spend it on and why and yeah. um and just get out there and ask for it yeah make it an opportunity as opposed to really sorry to ask this is the opportunity this is the stage to get to get in how exciting is this make it exciting hopefully you've got to speak to them on the phone first because it's so much easier to warm someone up on a phone call or in person we're, we're going to have that soon everyone um but warm them up on a phone call and then shoot this across with your fabulous deck and, and what you what you have and financials, just really short and, and brief. Well, we've got some great questions here. Um, so first one, I think this might be for you, Barbara. Do, in, do investors expect you to put money in yourself? If so, how much of the round should you contribute? Oh, I put in loads of my own money along the way. <laughs> but yes, yes, they do expect you to put in some money. Um, I think it's about proving your concept and and uh, knowing that uh, you know knowing that you believe in your product to believe in it enough to put in your own money. Yeah. Um, along uh, another question that's sort of similar to that is what's the minimum investment some, can someone apply for investment from an investor? I don't think there is a minimum, is there? Really, it's sort of we can go for funds and things, but. Your guy is five million with where you work, and I, we, you know, we help raise a million for people. But uh, I don't think there is a minimum. Do, do you? Or? No, I don't. I don't think so. When you start having shareholders in a business, um, it just becomes very complicated if you're taking small amounts of money. But you need to get that. You need to get that traction in the beginning anyway. So um, small amounts of money. You can't. You're not going to turn down. Five thousand pounds or ten thousand pounds, just because you think, okay, I'd rather have fifty. And when you're just getting it off the ground, those shareholders can be diluted down later, or those shareholders can invest a bit more, so they're not diluted down. Then I've got a couple for Jane, for all of us actually. Okay. Uh, and this is about the deck. We've got some more complicated ones, but I'll get the nice easy <laughs> ones out first. Is what's the biggest? So with the deck, what's one? What's the biggest turn off? And how many slides should a first look deck have? Well, I, I personally can answer that one to say, keep it down underneath 14. And my biggest turn off is when I get a slide deck in my, in my inbox, please don't just call it pitch deck number one. Please put your brand, your date. <laughs> yeah, your name. that's true. <laughs> and, and inside your slide deck, one thing that you, everyone fails to do is put their contact details on the last slide. There's usually a wow picture and a big fact, but there's no contact details. So they're, they're my ones is name your deck, the name of your company, please. And tell me what you're raising. So series A for bananagram.com um, and a date. Then I can find it in my inbox because I have so many pitch decks that come in. So any, any other smellies from you two that you don't like? Well, uh, I'll jump back to the past previous question very quickly on, on, on minimum investment and so on. Just to say that it's it's very varied. So when you get up to the kind of larger fund level, naturally they they have to operate in specific ways. But at very early stages, you know, if you're going out to angels and so on, they can write very small tickets for you. Um, you just have to convince them that they're the right investor and excite them about the idea. Really, um, I know people that have done rolling rounds where they're taking a thousand pound checks at very early stages, you know, where they're, they're rolling it month on month just to, to prove the concept and get it out there. Um, so yeah, there, there isn't a, a, there isn't a minimum. I think as well, some, some people, I've got a couple of, of funds which have other hard limits. They, they like to write larger ticket sizes, but they have um, the expectancy that you have X amount of revenue or, you deliver on certain milestone before they'll consider you. And so there, there's, there's various types of profiles and various types of interests that different investors have at different sizes and so on. Um, I think that's a, that's a fair comment. On the pitch deck side of things, yeah, 12 slides should nail it. Um, more than that, and you just get into, 
into noise. Uh, it turns investors off. They see a lot of these every single day and uh, they've got a limited amount of time and a limited amount of intention. So you can basically sum up a business in 12 slides unless it's something spectacular. And in that case, you still hammer the 12 slides and you stick an appendix on the back or external links as, as a necessary. Um, the biggest turnoff, uh, the most common thing I see is invest. And it's, it's also, um, I'm not trying to drag any founders because it's, it's a very difficult thing at that very early stage is, is oversharing or repeating content and information. I think because you're so close to your business, um, you want to put everything into the deck, right? And you don't want anything to be missed for fear of an investor passing or for an investor not understanding. But actually what you're doing is, is, is building up too much noise that they can't get through and it's confusing. And so one of the jobs I do most of the time is to, is to cut information. So I'll edit things down to a very clear uh, vision um, and look at how we signpost content throughout the deck so that it's very quickly recognizable by people like Louise and Barbara. Um, and they can take that information in in the space of 90 seconds, four minutes, whatever, five minutes. Um, so yeah, uh, too much information is an absolute killer, I think. Thank you. There's a couple of um, ones here that, so there's a couple that overlap in the questions. So do investors prefer to fund growth marketing PR versus build an MVP? So that's one of them. And then, uh, which is, this one's quite close. For founders in that tough stage, usually B2C, you need to launch a pretty robust MVP any sort of user traction, but need funds, um, how best to position limited tra traction? So, so you've got two, do, I think the investors, Barbara, you can probably talk about this as well, but for me, because I work in marketing, yeah. um, I've seen people burn through a lot of money. Um, and when I work for Notion VC and I get called in when people have got their, have got their money and they've gone a bit wild, bought new carpets, had parties, <laughs> done a website, but actually none of it um, relates to the sales. So there's a radical focus on who your customer. So before you go into marketing and PR, get your personas right, get your customer profiles right, and then look at your minimal viable product. So that's what the investor will expect you to know is who your who your the, your ideal customer profile, your ideal co co company profile, and then they'll talk to you about how you spend your money. They're not going to give you the money and just let you throw it into one bucket anyway. It'll it'll be spread. So that that was mine, but um. As for at this stage, how do you get traction um, in the deck? Are you working with anyone that's having this problem that they've got, they haven't really got a mini, um, a minimum viable product at the moment, James? I mean, it's a, it's a broad question in some respects. So, I mean, what, what, I think it was Elon Musk said, you know, build something customers love and then make lots of it. And it's like, it's that simple. Like if you can build something that's good and it makes sense and, and you, even if there's a small piece of traction, I think investors are quite good at being able to see that that can, well, if it can be scaled, investors are quite good at being able to see the opportunity, mm -hmm. smell the money in the business. And so it doesn't, it's not necessarily from my perspective at very early stages, it's not so much about how much traction you can show. It's that you can show that that traction can be scaled. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Um, in terms of, in terms of how you convey it, there's diff, I mean, it's, it's, it's individual to each business is how you try to talk about the, the traction, the business case and so on and so forth. And so it, it really is a kind of um, a consultancy process to go in to understand the business and how best to present that back to people um, in a way that will, will yeah, support the best business case. Um, it's maybe not a perfect answer, but that's the best I can come up with, unfortunately. <laughs> Barbara, do you have any thoughts? Guys, um, just before we um, continue with the questions, um, I'm just going to uh, uh, nip in because um, I, I know we're moving into the sort of question phase um, and we may lose a few people. But James, I know that you've got an offer to help some of the guys here. So it'd be great to, to, to just run that past everyone. Um, yeah, sure. Of course. Well, I mean, like I said, this consultancy I run, I'm, I'm, I do it day to day. Um, it's kind of bread and butter stuff for me. And I'm, I'm very happy to help people out um, with an initial consultation. So if anyone wants to contact me by email, I'm happy to uh, review their decks uh, free of charge and give them some written uh, feedback on how they could be improved. If you'd like to work with me, um, that's fine. It's obviously no obligation. I'm happy to try and help out. One of and just on that on that case because it sounds like a hard sell type of thing. Um, one of the reasons, one of the things that's been really great about working in this space over the last few years, and I still continue to enjoy every day, 
is that most conversation, in fact, every conversation is almost always interesting because you speak to interesting people, solving interesting problems, building interesting businesses. And so it's, it's very rare that I come off a call or I reply to an email, which has kind of wound me up or I felt like is a waste of time. And so, yeah, be very happy to um, be very happy to review any investment decks uh, and, and, and share some written, uh, re written feedback. Yeah. And, and what I'd say, you know, I've, I've seen, a, 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 you know, James, J James is uh, great at, um, you know, analyzing the decks, having worked with so many. Um, I think one of the reasons why, you know, we, we work with James um, is because it's not, it's not, he doesn't just look at it from a, a sort of a visual perspective. Uh, he understands the business points. And I think that's invaluable. And, and I think like most um, good, you know, good people in the startup space, you know, the value you will get from working with someone and improving your deck by 30, 40, 50, 100% um, will help you 10 times over when you actually, when you do your fundraising. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I do think it's, it's worth, worth getting that feedback from, 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 from people. And, you know, and it's something that we do uh, as well as, as, as EEC is, 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 is help, help with that, that side. And we, we find it's really good at, this, at the start of your fundraising journey to get that external advice. Because frankly, sending it to your mum or some of your friends to, to review, whilst you might get some feedback, uh, is probably not going to be the, the most unbiased uh, uh, feedback. Uh, anyway, I will, I will duck back off there and I'll let you guys continue with the questions because I see some brilliant questions coming through. So. There's, a, there's one here that I know particularly Barbara won't like, but I'm going to ask it. As an investor, how do you value an early stage business? Oh, I, <laughs> ask, one of my, um, ask one of my team. <laughs> it is really hard, isn't it? I mean, it's um, really hard. And, and to overvalue it makes you sort of look at it and go, really? So um, I think it's a, it's a question for... Um, uh, someone with with um who, who's used to valuing companies that's not that's not me <laughs> yeah if I, I could have a punt at this i mean I, again take this as a comment rather than any kind of expert mm. adv advice but what i often see in it because i get asked it a lot as well and you know i'm not a financial analyst and i'm not a business analyst i don't I don't come up with these kind of metrics and so on. And often at such early stages, there are no business metrics, right? It, it does come down mm -hmm. to gut, especially at angel level when, when, like you say, the kind of the data that you have on the business, the customer base and so on, the, the, actual, the actual product is still in flux. And so it's a difficult thing to settle on. Um, and so I don't know, Barbara, whether you would James, agree with me. If, if you're very early stage, yes, there are some metrics that you can do the calculation on if you've, if you've got traction with business. But if you're very early stage and you're getting in front of one of, one of your first investors, well, quite a nice way to put it is turn it to them and then it flatters them. If you can say to the investor, um, what do you think I should value it at? It makes them feel like they're in the position of power and giving them some authority to make that decision. They probably tell them the same thing as I would say, get um, get someone who knows how to value a company to do it, but... Um, it's, yeah, it's I, 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 I might chip in there with a, a couple of like, uh, I think sort of basic rules for, for, sure. for, for seed stage companies. Um, you know, I haven't seen quite a few of these come through um, through through the Entrepreneurs Collective as, as well. Uh, there is some sort of hard, not I wouldn't say hard rules, but general rules that quite a lot of the seed stage guys look at. So, you know, generally for most people, if you're pre-revenue, you know, you, there's a sort of a hardish ceiling round about sort of 3 million um, for a, a normal startup, unless you've got, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, particular patents or some sort of some some sort of uh, uh, pipeline that that makes you really outside of the norm. But normally, you're looking at sort of a pre-revenue stage. Like with an idea, you're probably maxing out at a million, unless you are a serial entrepreneur or you're coming to it with something sort of groundbreaking. Um, uh, once you've got MVP and traction uh, and maybe a, a few customers or some people using the product you're looking at one to 2 million, over 2 million, then you really need to have like a killer idea or lots of experience or, or, or something that says, this is going to, this is on its way to, to work in. Um, I think, I think the most I've seen somewhat like, obviously there are some exceptions, you know, so serial entrepreneurs who've been there and done it, 
you can get valuations. You know, I think I've seen a couple of people get, you know, three, four, five million with just a deck um, and an idea. But then also they've built like three, four companies previously. So, mm. you, you know, they're in good hands and they've done it before. Uh, and that's the sort of you, you need a, a big differentiator to get to get uh, above that. But I think, as Barbara said, I've also seen some ideas that some people go out and try and fundraise with valuations of four or five million when, frankly, they've got, you know, they achieve nothing and have no experience. And, then, you know, as an investor, you might love the idea. But once you see that valuation, you just think, well, this this person has, hasn't got a, you know, has, hasn't got a clue. Right. And, you know, it's really unrealistic. Uh, and I think that's a massive, massive turn off um, uh, for, for an investor as well. Michael, I think it sounds like a topic for a round table, don't you? Yeah. How, possibly, to, how to value your company? Just belt yeah. it off certain lawyers. <laughs> I think the, the point I was going to make was um, you, if you've overvalued it, if you've overvalued it you'll, you'll find out soon enough when you start taking it out because you won't want to invest. You'll get, you'll get a lot of soft passes and you may get yeah. the odd hard as well. And so you'll figure it out quick enough. Yeah. Um, yes, we've all been there. Shall Is I answer it, that question on advice for people um, outreaching uh, through cold emails? Yeah, I thought that would be good. Yeah, because we, we do have to do this all the time. And it's it's really painful if you think, oh, I've got a business for a, a certain investor and you don't know how to get to them. Um, if I if I haven't met them before, what I do is is connect with them on LinkedIn first so that they can at least understand your profile a little bit and they've probably got people in common with you so so get there first and if they connect back to you just say i'm going to pop something in your inbox hope you don't mind they generally say yes if you go out and you go actually i'm just on linkedin i'm looking at this person but one of my good friends knows that person ask your good friend do how well do they know that person someone did this to me the other day and you know i've got three and a half thousand LinkedIn um, contacts. Of course, I don't know them all. But I said, he said, do you know X? And I went, yes, our daughters went to school together. I know him really well. He goes, do you mind asking him if he, and I went, he does not miss with that. And that, <laughs> it was that simple. So use use your network to help you out. Does that help? Does that help? Do you have any more thoughts on that, Louise? I think you're right. Use your network. And once we're out of this, I, the other thing that I do is yeah, I look at our in front of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get out. But the other thing I do is if you know, you know where you want to get the money, these every single um, VC runs open webinars. Get your, get yourself in that audience. Mm, and good the idea. Person that you're going to, you know. Maybe, well, maybe Louise, you could join like a really nice, friendly community with lots of connections. <laughs> oh, yes. Good I don't know. Just the thought, just the thought <laughs> guys. They just probably thought. know everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't make it a cold email. What you want no, to do. I never, I never answer them. There's not a single cold email no, that I answer. Say. Please don't cut and paste. Don't make it a cold. Find an item of value that you have for the guy you're sending it to a woman and, and make a connection before you send the email. And, yeah. and VCs, um, so I work in insure tech and fintech. So I know the VCs that invest in that space. Most VCs have um, a defined category they work in. So know the VC and know whether they invested in your space. If you're selling chocolates, don't go to, vent, uh, to a venture yeah. capital and he does SaaS. You, know, you only no, have so many chances to really annoy them. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they have got very short fuses. So are there any other questions we can answer from here? That um, There was one actually that was more for Michael that I think so there's quite a few angel questions and they're not really our bit. So that that's sort of, for, if go back to Entrepreneur Collective and to Michael, he's, he's the expert on what angels do and what they take. Um, there's one interesting one actually about a company that's been, has um, a company has been trading for years and has got a proven track record and is raising capital to scale. And what, would this be considered a seed round or a Series A? So it's been a company that's been trading for years. It's got traction and considerable rate revenue and is raising capital to scale. Just call it a growth round. Growth round, yeah. And yeah. and I think it, uh, you don't have to Series label A. Them all. 
No, I, I think growth round, and it depends how much you're raising. Because the Series A is three to seven million, isn't it? Generally, if you're looking for something larger, then Series B or C. Just look at that; it, it's defined quite significantly. So growth round, in if brackets, growth well, round. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's that's about us. Is, are there any other questions? I think we've run out of time. I do like this suggestion, though. If Michael's still with us, that we run a. Um, game show for startup valuation called startup valuation yeah uh, injector uh, yeah i quite like the <laughs> thought of that uh, yeah it'd be a brief Harris start yeah yeah and then uh th there's a where to find investors for a particular sex sector that's actually research uh, yeah. and the ec michael's team here will help you but lots of uh, this job is about research there's uh, so much desktop research and i think that's that the unprepared founder is the founder that doesn't use Google to death before they start their deck or their journey. Yeah. So one of the things that, that we do, um, uh, and you know, you, you don't have to. We, we we've got access to a tool called Bauhurst, um, which we purchase for our members, and um, essentially it, it it sort of has, uh, it, you know, lists out uh, investors in the various startups across the UK and the US. So what we we do is, you know, you don't have to do this you know, through a tool like Bauhurst, it just makes it a lot quicker, but is try and think about who is your competition um, and who, what, who's got similar ideas to you. Um, and then, you know, you can go to a company's house uh, or look at the press releases and have a look who who's invested in those guys. Because, you know, if they've invent, invested in, you know, if you look at five or 10 other insurance startups, um, that ticks both the boxes that, you know, uh, Barbara and Louise were saying about having that nexus, because then you can approach them and say, hey, you know, David, uh, I saw that you invested in X startup. We are also in the insurance space, um, but we would love to, to connect and chat. And then, you know, once they respond, then say, oh, actually, I'd love to pick your brain and ask for advice on the startup. Uh, and I think there, you at least, it shows that you've done your research, it shows that you know what they're into, uh, and also you know that they're an active investor in your space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whilst that might take, you know, you know, you're talking a bit of research for all these companies, um, you know, those types of approaches stand a lot better chance of being successful um, than just, you know, cold searching on LinkedIn for, for investors and, and random things like that. Mm. There's two more general questions there. Have you seen them pop in? When's the right time to incorporate a private company? Um, it, do you see it as an issue if the team looking for pre-seed investments hasn't set up a company yet? That actually sounds like Michael type questions, but it might be Barbara type questions. No, well, you usually want to have set up a company because you would have a bank account attached to it. I'd like to bank my money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, you know, you need a limited company. Um, uh, really, like, a, you know, you want to be using a limited company because you're, you know, the, 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 the point of it being limited is, is that it protects the shareholders because you're limited to the amount of money that you've put in. Um, you know, you would never invest in a sole trader because then, you know, as a sole trader, you're, you know, you are on, you are on hook for, for uh, any, 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 any debts personally as a sole trader. Um, so the limited company is there to protect you. So, uh, and also when you're aiming to, you know, apply for certain things, you need to be a limited company like R and D tax credits, SEIS, all these things. So, um, so yeah. So generally, it's probably one, the, one of the first things you do. Uh, yeah. And I think that maybe there's another question there as well from Jill Wilson Louise. Yeah, she's think, been yeah. very patient. Yeah, she's yeah. got an MVP in a target market. This also tapped a new market which was not intended to. Should she include this in her deck and, or will it make the proposition weaker? I, I, it depends on what the new market is. Mm. Um, it, it, and, and also what they, as we said about the pain and the solution and your target market, which one's got the most value in it? So if your current market is a slow burner and you're making a regular income, but it's not that interesting to the investor, if you found a new market, which is a faster growth, more potential, better product market fit than include it. Um, so without knowing what the product is and where it's established and where it's growing into, it's a hard one, but you, you could, I'll, I'll go to you, James, because you, you work on lots of things like this, but for me, it would be which one's got the most 
most potential. No, you're absolutely right. You need, need to look at it, you know, specifically to, to understand how you tell that story. Um, but you're right. The, the way you the way you walked out there, um, Louis, there is an opportunity there to tell the story of of uh, possible future growth from a new stream that hadn't initially been uh, banked upon. And so maybe that is a way that you can kind of leverage that to to your advantage. And um, one of the things I see quite a bit, though, which I do think is a mistake, and uh, I think you both agree with me, or, or all three of you would agree with me, is that <clears throat> sometimes companies either haven't figured out or they're worried that their main revenue stream isn't going to be compelling enough. And so they build out 15 revenue streams. We can also make money this way. We can also make money this way. We can also make money this way. Hmm. Thinking that if you know the investor, that they're hedging, that they're not, that they're not beholden to one form of, of, of um, revenue. What they're actually saying is that you haven't either, either you haven't figured it out or um, you haven't got one compelling way to make money often. I think there's, there's mm -hmm. that, that sometimes fractures the, the, the kind of um, the story and conversation and, and, and makes the, the pitch weaker. Um, yeah. There's another money one here. Um, as there's a month to go before April the 5th, is there a way of tapping into the SEIS and EIS angel investors who want this tax break? I don't know very much about the tax break and angel investors. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I, I guess, it, so the SEIS, EIS, so people have annual allowances, um, which they can as an investor invest. Um, so some people might want to get it in, but actually as an investor, you can back right. in backfill your investments, um, I think up to three years. So it's not, the deadline is less important for the investors. Um, mm -hmm. normally who it is important for is some of the SEIS or EIS funds, um, who make commitments to their investment base. Uh, so there, are, I think some, you know, seed specialist EIS and SEIS funds, um, such as uh, the Startup Funding Club, Deep Bridge Capital, a few of wow. these guys who commit to, to doing a certain percentage of EIS and SEIS each year. Uh, and I know that towards the end of the year, if they haven't filled their quota, then actually, you know, they're, they, are, they are keen. And, uh, and I think, especially this year with what's been going on with COVID, probably some of these funds will be looking to do um, uh, sort of you know, uh, we'll probably be trying to fill those quarters um, towards mm. the end. Um, but probably what I would say is, given that there's a month to go, you, you know, you yeah. need to be reaching out like now to stand any chance to, to, I would to, say to get that done. I would say they wouldn't have time in a month because it takes a bit longer than a month to close it. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. So I think we're, 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 we're past time and I think we got through most of the questions. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, we'll, we'll sort of call it there, um, but I just want to thank uh, uh, the, the speakers, uh, James, Louise, Barbara, uh, great session, um, some really uh, insightful questions um, and, and answers, uh, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, uh, hopefully we will see you at our future events um, uh, and we will be circulating a, a, a video of this and materials uh, post event. Uh, so yeah. So thanks again to everyone and uh, hopefully uh, see you guys soon. Thanks, Michael. Thanks bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye. bye.